Being a competitor trying to rise to the top of your game is rightly so a very difficult task that requires a lot of work and effort. But sometimes, no matter how hard you try, there is always someone better than you. Sad fact of life, but that's just the nature of things. Some people, however, refuse to accept that. And instead of working harder to increase their skills and rising to the top the honest way, they might instead just try to eliminate the competition. The Nancy Carrigan attack. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Raycon. With Raycon Everyday Earbuds and Headphones, you can instantly improve your audio experience with stunning quality and at a much better price compared to other premium audio brands, with added features to perfect your unique sound profile. Raycon also has even more products to offer too, with Raycon Home and Raycon PowerTech, like the Magic 180 cable which adds extra comfort for when you need a charge, among other high-speed cables and chargers. The everyday earbuds are better than ever, with an aesthetic rubber look in multiple colours and a feel that is both sleek and discreet, as well as including multiple optimised gel tips to provide that perfect fit for all day maximum comfort, high quality sound and security regardless of the shape or size of your ears. Raycon everyday earbuds are more versatile than ever, with a built-in mic that allows you to take calls with the push of a button, they are also compatible with assistants such as Siri and Alexa, and include three easy-to-toggle audio profiles for you to customise to your liking. There is also a noise isolation and awareness mode for audio transparency when you need it. Raycon also offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. People like them so much that their products have earned tens of thousands of 5 star reviews. I use my Raycons every day and make use of awareness mode which often allows me to hear my music without drowning out my surroundings. And Raycon's everyday headphones are a must have for any audio lover, with a customisable comfortable fit, amazing sound quality, active noise cancellation, 40 hours of battery life, portability and 5 microphones for crystal clear calls all day. Raycon products would also make a perfect last minute holiday gift or to help someone bring in the new year. And why not take a look at Raycon's limited time bundles that should make it a lot easier for you to buy multiple gifts at once at a discount. So to get premium audio and power tech at a great price this holiday season, go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get 15% off site wide and to help support the channel. Now, this video isn't a mad lad, but I do need to preface this story with a little bit about each of the people involved. Nancy Ann Carrigan was born on October the 13th, 1969, in Stoneham, Massachusetts, as the youngest child and only daughter of Daniel and Brenda Carrigan. Her family wasn't rich, despite what some people believe. In fact, her father actually had to work three jobs just to fund her skating lessons. But she had a far more wholesome upbringing than her rival. And her parents tried to keep up appearances and give their daughter a good childhood to the best of their ability. Also, if anyone's wondering why my voice sounds terrible, it's because I've got a throat infection. But the show must go on, so... Deal with it. Contrast that with Tonya Maxine Harding, who was born on November the 12th, 1970, in Portland, Oregon, as the only child to Lavona Golden and Albert Harding. Her father could barely keep a job, often switching between low-skilled careers. He sometimes worked at a bait-and-tackle store as a truck driver or an apartment manager. He started to work even less as his health began to decline. Her mother, Lavona, worked as a waitress, and with the combined income of Albert, they paid for figure skating lessons for Tonya from the age of three years old. 
Eventually, her parents divorced when Tonya was 16, likely because Lavona had unrealistic expectations of her husband, and her husband had likely grown tired of her horrible personality and attitude. Which is a running theme for her since Lavona also had unrealistic expectations of Tonya as well. According to Tonya, her mother was very cold and violent as she grew up. She never praised her or showed her any amount of affection. She only told her that she wasn't good enough, and by her logic, she thought that that was the only way to make her improve. She would force Tonya to skate for hours without letting her leave the ice rink, since the lessons cost a lot of money. It's believed that Lavona wouldn't even let Tonya go to the bathroom, so she would just wet herself on the rink. As for some of the physical abuse, Lavona had allegedly hit Tonya with a hairbrush at the rink, and at one point even threw a steak knife at her. Although she definitely wasn't a great mother to Tonya, there are some contrasting interviews of her mother defending her. But this might have just been for the cameras. Later, during her skating career, Tonya Harding was the first American woman to successfully perform a triple axle, which made her extremely egotistical and, despite being on top, even more competitive, always keeping an eye out to see if she would be upstaged. Now, to be clear, I'm not much of a fan of figure skating. Well, maybe a little bit. But a triple axle is extremely hard to perform, which is why it was such a big deal when Tonya Harding landed it successfully. To give you an idea of how difficult it is, a skater has to jump from the outside edge of one skate, perform a turn in midair, or in the case of a triple axle, three and a half turns, and then land backwards on the other skate. So the skater starts the move facing forward and must end up backwards while gathering enough speed and airtime to make the specified amount of turns. It's definitely something that looks far more effortless than it actually is. Tonya was, for lack of a better term, a redneck, so she felt like the judges were purposefully removing points from her because of that, meaning that other women that she saw as inferior were out-competing her. She might have had a point considering the judges were likely extremely pretentious and, let's face it, figure skating is a very, very snooty sport, so they definitely didn't like that Tonya was as skilled as she was. The real story started when Tonya met Jeff Galilee in 1986, when she was only 15 and he was 17. After many supervised dates, they moved in together, and Jeff very quickly became abusive, literally punching Tonya whenever he felt like it, and at one point slamming her hand in a car door. Lavona knew about his violent tendencies since he once tried to smash in her door thinking that Tonya had cheated on him. Two years after moving in, Tonya and Jeff married, which would be one of the biggest mistakes she ever made. In fact, the event that we are going to discuss in this video probably wouldn't have even happened if it wasn't for this marriage. As we've already mentioned, Jeff Galuli was a bit of a nutcase, and he continued to abuse Tonya until she couldn't take it anymore. He started stalking her, showing up during her skating practice, and even at her home. According to her, he tampered with her car so that she couldn't get away, and he kicked the door when she got out of it, which slammed onto her hand. Another time, he went to her house to steal her purse in order to get her to talk to him, but when Tonya showed up outside and tried to take it back from him, she was unsuccessful and stormed back into her apartment. And Jeff then chased her inside and threatened to shoot her and then himself. Tonya escaped the apartment, but Jeff shot in her direction. The bullet hit the pavement next to her and threw up a piece of asphalt, hitting her in the face. He then made her get into his car and he started to drive. However, the police thought that he was acting suspiciously and they gave chase. And eventually, they boxed in Jeff's car and got him and Tonya to get out. And strangely, Jeff wasn't charged for the incident, but he did have his handgun and shotgun confiscated. They even let him leave the scene with Tonya. 
So that sums up the type of guy that Galuli was. But Tonya really wasn't that much better. She was a pretty jealous and rather vindictive person, so she really had her back up when Nancy Carrigan, this new, beautiful, talented upstart, appeared on the scene. Tonya saw how skilled she was and immediately felt threatened by her. So she decided to try and do something about it. And despite both of them being rather estranged at this point, her nutcase of a husband decided to help her. At first, the plan only involved sending letters to Nancy. But not just any letters, they were full-on death threats. The idea was that they would psychologically mess with Nancy to throw her off her game in future competitions and make her paranoid and distracted. You know, worrying about some nutter running onto the ice to try and kill her. Which, in their mind, would give Tonya an advantage. But when this plan didn't really work, they decided to opt for more extreme measures. This is where a man named Sean Eckert gets involved in the story. He was Tonya's bodyguard and also a friend of Galuli. And he was a little bit mental himself since he had these weird delusions of grandeur. He would often tell people that he worked in counter-terrorism and counter-espionage despite all of that just being a giant pile of bullshit. He thought that he was some kind of mastermind, a Rambo macho man with the attitude of Steven Seagal, when in reality, he was just an overweight bodyguard with no real friends and he took his position way too seriously while still living with his parents. He and Jeff discussed how they were going to deal with Nancy. Jeff had wild ideas about assassinating her, but Sean told him that there were other ways of disabling someone. They discussed how they would do it, even considering running her off of the road or cutting her Achilles tendon, which most of you probably know wouldn't just stop her from skating, but probably would also stop her from walking properly for the rest of her life. They eventually decided on a physical attack, one that wouldn't kill her, but injure her enough so she couldn't compete. Galuli gave Sean a thousand dollars and told him to find someone to carry out the attack, but they couldn't find anyone because no one capable would take that amount of risk for such a small amount of money. So Galuli was told he needed to pay more. Eventually, he was put in touch with a man named Derek Smith, who was an associate of Sean. He was paid $6,500 to carry out the attack. He decided he couldn't carry out the attack by himself, so Derek enlisted the help of his own nephew, a man named Shane Stant. Shane initially planned to carry out the attack by himself and had travelled to Nancy's home skating rink in Cape Cod in late December of 1993, but he was unable to find her. He moved his car every 30 minutes to avoid suspicion, but because he's a complete moron, this actually drew suspicion to him because everyone's going, who's this guy that keeps moving his car around the parking lot exactly every 30 minutes? He also stayed in the area for two whole days waiting for Nancy, until he realised that she was actually skating in Detroit. So, they went to Detroit. On January the 6th, 1994, Derek acted as the wheelman, taking Shane to the entrance of the rink and giving him some guidance since Shane was not the brightest bulb in the box. He told Shane to look as if he belonged and not to act out of place to avoid any suspicion. The rink was massive, but he made his way through the maze of corridors, finally arriving at the ice rink where he spotted Nancy. Nancy, however, was being filmed at the time and there were a bunch of journalists around. So Shane couldn't really carry out the attack with so many witnesses and cameras rolling. But Nancy then left the rink through some curtains just as the cameraman put his equipment down. So Shane moved in and carried out the attack. Shane followed closely behind her and pulled out a telescopic baton. And with one swift strike, he broke Nancy's right knee, which was her landing leg. 
It happened so quickly that she didn't see it coming and Shane ran from the scene straight away, leaving Nancy in absolute agony. And just as an aside, those telescopic battens might look flimsy, but Jesus Christ, they fucking hurt. I've been arrested more times than just Nazi Pug, and I am somewhat cheeky and non-compliant. So, I've met the business end of one of those quite a few times, but I digress. Since the camera guy was still not too far away, he quickly grabbed his camera and caught the aftermath of the attack almost immediately. After fleeing the attack on Nancy, Shane was full of adrenaline since he didn't want to get caught. And he was trying to find a way out of the rink and people were already looking for him. The door to the outside of the rink was locked and, as we mentioned before, Shane wasn't very smart. So, in a panic, he used his empty head to smash his way through the glass. Yes, he actually head-butted through the glass door and miraculously, it worked. Derek was really pissed off at Shane for causing such a scene and very likely thought of just leaving him there. But instead, he quickly pulled up so that Shane could jump in the car for a not-so-clean getaway. Despite how shoddy the getaway was, none of the security staff or anyone else in the rink caught up with Shane. The aftermath of the attack was massive on the news. Everywhere people looked, they heard about the attack. Also, the video of Nancy going, why, why, became a massive meme before memes were even a thing. Which is why it's so well known even to this day. There was plenty of speculation as to who carried out the attack, but mysteries like this can usually be solved by asking a simple question. Who benefits? Who benefits the most from something like this? Tonya Harding. There were a bunch of conspiracies as to how she planned it and how she pulled it off. However, no one had any solid proof. Until it went to court. The only piece of evidence against Tonya was some paper where she had written down the name of Nancy's practice rink. Tonya and Jeff tried to explain this away by saying that they apparently had a bet on the location of the rink that Nancy skated at. Tonya called Vera Marano, a very well-known figure skating writer, to confirm the name of the rink. She at first misheard it as Tuni Can, but eventually found out that it was Tony Kent Arena. So she wrote it down to prove she was right and win the bet. Yeah, there's an absolute bullshit story. They were, they were clearly just trying to locate the rink that she would most likely practice at so that they could track her down. During Tonya's FBI testimony in January of 1994, it was found that she had lied to the FBI about attending Sean's house with Jeff, which led them to believe that she might have been involved. But it turns out that Tonya actually left before any plans about the attack were discussed. But because she had lied to federal agents, she had committed a crime. When interviewed by Coin TV in Portland, the interviewer asked Tonya if she might know the people who planned the attack, which Tonya responded with, I have definitely thought about it. And then she went on to say, No one controls my life but me. If there's something in there that I don't like, I'm going to change it. Which didn't exactly make her seem innocent. Sean, the bodyguard, however, was an absolute paint huffer who just could not stop bragging to people about how it was him that orchestrated the attack. Since it was all over the news, it was his proudest moment and he felt like he had achieved something. But, of course, going around telling everyone that you committed a crime is not the smartest thing to do. Especially when that crime is all over national news. 
He eventually told one of his friends named Gene Saunders that he was the mastermind behind the attack. And he was so excited that he even showed him some shoddily recorded video footage of Jeff and him planning the attack. Gene was absolutely appalled by what he had just heard, so he told Sean to hand himself in to the police. When Sean didn't do that, Gene went to the FBI instead. Apparently, the reason that Sean kept the video recording was to use it for promoting his future company, World Bodyguard Services. Now, as, as someone who worked in private security for a number of years, why, why, why would you ever think that a video of you and a guy plotting to maim an innocent woman would be good promo for your security company? Why? Who, who is that stupid? Who is that? That is the fastest way to get instantly blacklisted from everywhere. Who is that stupid? Why, why would anyone think that? I mean, I have absolutely no fucking idea, but it's a good thing he held on to the footage because as a result of being caught with it, he received an 18-month prison sentence for racketeering, but he was released four months early in September of 1995. Shane was also dumb enough to have put the money that he was paid for the attack into his own visa account that was in his own name, which the police very quickly tracked down. And they also pulled the CCTV footage of him parking his car every 30 minutes at Nancy's home rink. It's still really fucking funny that he thought that that would draw less attention to him, especially since he did it for two whole days. He now says that he fully regrets everything he has done and presumably found God during his time in jail. What would you say to her today? Just that I hope that that she understands that I was sorry for what I did and that I'm a different person. Galuli was caught for the most part because he hired absolute idiots to carry out the job, especially since Sean couldn't keep his mouth shut and Shane was a complete moron. Also, since they all kind of knew each other beforehand and they were all connected in some way, it didn't really take much for the cops to link everyone involved. Especially since they weren't exactly loyal to each other because they all started ratting each other out. On February the 1st, 1994, a plea deal was negotiated for Galuli to serve just two years in prison as long as he testified against everyone else involved. The reason for all of this mess was purely down to jealousy. Tonya was jealous of Nancy because she thought that everything had come easy for her. She thought that she had a perfect family, no money troubles, and that everyone loved her. Because Tonya didn't have the wholesome American women aesthetic that the United States Figure Skating Association wanted, and Nancy did, she wanted to remove the competition because she believed she couldn't match up with her. Nancy was everything that the association was looking for in a skater to represent America. She dressed well and was highly skilled, and despite the fact that Tonya had been the first to pull off a triple axel, it wasn't enough for the board to accept her. It was also down to Jeff's obsession with Tonya, since the reason he organised the attack on Nancy was because he still loved Tonya and he wanted to do all of this for her in the hopes that she would take him back and maybe fall in love with him again. Tonya was given three years of probation, a $160,000 fine, and 500 hours of community service after she pleaded guilty to conspiring to handle the prosecution because she had lied to federal agents. But since she had no involvement in the actual attack, or more because the feds couldn't prove that she did, she got no charges for that. She began to actually receive death threats herself from people who believed that she had been part of the attack and had escaped justice. The biggest punishment for her involvement, however, was on the 30th of June, 1994, when the board banned Tonya Harding for life from the United States Figure Skating Association for violating their code of ethics, which for her was a fate much worse than prison. All she knew was skating. 
And outside of that, she had no other skills, and she had already screwed up much of her life outside of skating. So, she became a boxer instead, and despite her three wins and three losses, she hasn't broken any records. And she didn't take to it quite like she did when she was skating. But, I guess she was used to taking one in the face after living with Jeff for so long. Her mother, Lavona, is well into her old age, and while she does want contact with Tonya, they are both now very estranged. Thankfully, after the ordeal, Nancy made a full recovery, and she got back into skating. She won the silver in the Olympics, and she went on to do non-competitive skating performances, such as Footloose on Ice and Broadway on Ice, which she actually still does to this day. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.